Well, uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I am Ruben Giorgino. I am the privilege to be the head of clinical research and development at, uh, at Azafaros. Um, first of all, I would like to, to thank Siu, Siu Ken, uh, not only for the T-shirt that we have uh, received just this morning, uh, jokes apart, but uh, Siu and all the NTSAT organizing committee for giving you know, has the opportunity to introduce uh, Azafaros and uh, our main project in, um, in GM1 and uh, GM2 glycosidosis. Is it visible now? Yes, looks great. Okay. So um, Azafaros, uh, I mean, was founded uh, to be and to maintain uh, the role as a strongly uh, science driven company. And we ambition to finally develop uh, disease modifying uh, molecule that can tangibly change the, the clinical course of, uh, of rare metabolic disorders. And our first uh, project, uh, SZ3102, goes into, into this direction. Um, I mean, to do so, we uh, enormously, you know, uh, value the central role of, uh, of the patients and their parents in, uh, in supporting and uh, say in partnering with uh, the academy and also the, uh, the industry in, in this. Uh, I would say is a, it's not by chance that uh, we have decided for the very first time, I would say ever, to present and to introduce what, uh, what we are doing today at this, at this meeting at uh, the DSAD uh, family conference. So uh, needless to say that uh, there is a certain level of emotion today from our side and, and excitement at the same time to, to present at this, at this conference being the first time ever we do it. So it's a uh, I think is a sign of our will to engage with uh, all the patients' association in the in the future. Uh, as I was saying before, the the, the, the focus will be um, will be on rare genetic metabolic disorders and the uh, SZF102. Uh, the, the compound I'm going to talk about uh, goes into this direction, uh, and and again the indication that we are looking at at the moment is GM1 and GM2 cancerosis, but we have also embarked. Uh, not recently, I mean, since a while, on a drug discovery program still in the area of, uh, of genetic metabolic uh, disorders. Now, you, you are uh, pretty familiar with the information which are in these uh, in these slides about the genetics, uh, the epidemiology, the medical condition of, of uh, patients with GM1 and GM2 gangrocidosis. Uh, from our side, we mm, appreciate, of course, and recognize the highly the vastly high unmet medical needs in, this, uh, in these two diseases. And, um, and we also believe that uh, the characteristics of AZ3102 uh, allow us to, to believe in the potential of this compound uh, in uh, treating this disease. An important point, and, uh, and Dr. Trocan uh, from Idorsia was already mentioning this point, we do believe that the two diseases share some uh, uh, pathogenic, pathogenic and clinical aspects that would possibly allow us uh, to run a single clinical development program, uh, including the two, the two diseases. But of course, this is something that we are going to test uh, soon uh, in a project that I'm going to talk, uh, to talk about. So the next slide is a it looks probably complex, uh, but uh, we do believe that is important because it's introducing our compound AZ3102. And uh, AZ3102 interferes with uh, two key pharmacological targets uh, of the of, you know, pertinent to the, to the disease with uh, similarly high potency. So the potency in the inhibition of two enzyme that I'm going to, <laughs> to cover in a second, uh, is, is the same. So the, the compound is a very highly potent inhibitor of uh, both 
glucosyl ceramide synthase, uh, which is involved in the, uh, of course, in the synthesis of glucosphingolipids. So by uh, uh, reducing the activity of this enzyme, uh, uh, we target to reduce the accumulation of, of uh, complex glucosphingolipids. I mean, is a concept which is very well known as substrate reduction therapy. But on top of it, um, the azf 102 is inhibiting uh, another enzyme, which is also important, which is the non-lysosomal glucosyl ceramidase. I acknowledge that is a very complex term, but uh, in you know this second mechanism of action uh, would uh, allow to uh, prevent or uh, reduce the accumulation, the intercellular accumulation of possible uh, harmful uh, metabolites and at the same time to normalize the impaired function of the lysosome. So this is a, a way of tackling the, 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 the pathogenesis of the two diseases uh, in, uh, I mean, at the same time and with the same level of potency as I was uh, referring before. So um, another important point that is very high, highly selective, so there is no effect on uh, the saccharidesis on the intestinal digestive enzyme. So, uh, this is uh, clinically uh, has an important clinical potential because we don't expect uh, you know, off-target uh, and unexpected uh, adverse event at the gastrointestinal level. And, uh, and by the way, this is a finding that we have already seen confirmed in the animal studies where we didn't see any um, intestinal, especially adverse, adverse event. Uh, the kinetics of the drug from what we have seen in animals, but from what also we are seeing in humans, uh, allows for a once, uh, once a day um, administration, sorry. And uh, uh, we are already working on, uh, on the pediatric formulation, uh, specifically designed uh, to be used in, uh, in young children with GM1 and GM2 gangocidosis. And of course, in this way, uh, the therapy would allow for uh, for being used uh, chronically. Um, I mean, to adjust the dose uh, based on, on on body weight, and of course, the assumption behind uh, is that uh, um, I mean, it's not a, a disease specific approach, uh, and certainly is not driven by uh, specific mutations that could be at the basis of uh, of the disease. Uh, the, the product, I mean, the project is at clinical stage. I'm really very, uh, very happy to, to share with you this information that we have also made public uh, some, uh, some weeks ago. So exactly one month ago, we started our uh, first human study uh, in healthy subjects. So it's important to emphasize it. And um, we're not only going to look at, as it is standard, as it is usually done at uh, exposure uh, of, of the drug in the, in the plasma and in the urine, we are also looking at uh, uh, the concentration in the cerebrospinal fluid as a proxy of, uh, uh, of, um, of brain penetration, uh, maybe in the little chaos I've done before, I didn't uh, mention a very important aspect, which is that in animals we have seen uh, that there is brain exposure uh, in animals, and, uh, and and this exposure is also matched and uh, with uh, uh, what we were expecting in terms of pharmacodynamic effect uh, of the product. So in animals we have already a proof of concept, uh, you know, that the, the drug is able to reach the brain. And, uh, and to exert the pharmacodynamic effect that we were uh, uh, hoping to see. Well, of course, this data will further uh, you know, substantiate our confidence in the uh, fact that uh, the, the product does reach the brain at uh, concentration which are sufficient to, to exert a pharmacodynamic effect. Um, the study has started, as I was saying before, we hope to see the results in the second half of the year, I would say after summer. And, and of course, the inf this information, if everything goes well, of course, we hope so, will, um, will allow to um, identify the doses and also the dosing regimen that we are going to use in the future study in, in patients this time. Um, 
who were already covering the topic of, uh, of the value of natural history studies. And I'm very happy, really uh, honored to announce today that we are starting this summer um, enrollment into a purely perspective. So it's going to be perspective only um, natural history of disease study. Uh, it's going to be multi-regional uh, in, um, to say in um, at least 12 countries in the world in we're targeting 35 sites. Uh, and the objective are, uh, I mean, of course, the need of a prospective natural history study uh, also going back to the to the to the Kevin question before is also that the heterogeneity of standard of care, um, especially in this population, doesn't allow, uh, in our opinion, to have uh, a solid uh, measurement uh, quantification, let me say, of the longitudinal changes uh, of the major neurological aspects. So this is uh, something that we think we will be able to achieve only with a purely prospective study, as it was mentioned before. We want to build um, an external cohort data set under the assumption that uh, the pivotal study will not have, and we don't want to have a placebo arm in, in the future pivotal study. And another uh, important objective is also, if possible, to identify, I would say, factors which are predisposing to different rate uh, of neurological disease progression so that we, in the future we will be able to identify you know, high risk patients or patients who are going to have a very, uh, very rapid uh, rate of neurological disease progression. But apart from the scientific and the regulatory maybe aspect, uh, I think that what we want to do in this study and to make it uh, also as much, uh, I mean, to involve parents uh, as much as we can so that parents may have a really a central role into the, into the study. So we are uh, building a, an application uh, which is uh, running on smartphones and uh, also possibly accessible uh, on, on the PC, on, on laptops uh, to cover uh, questionnaires. Uh, I don't know, for instance, the Vineland uh, Adaptive Behavior Scale or uh, other uh, important aspects. Uh, we will have a quality of life um, questionnaire. We are also thinking of having a patient diary, you know, collecting information on seizures, on choking episodes, on, uh, um, on respiratory tract uh, infection. So parents being centrally involved. At the same time, we acknowledge the, the issue, uh, the logistics issue potentially coming from uh, uh, from uh, the burden of traveling or the burden of going to the site, uh, especially in these days. But in general, we know that this is a, a critical point in the adherence to the study, in the intensity of assessment. So what we are putting now also in place is, um, uh, is uh, you know, based on the virtual visit approach is to have a, a secure uh, and uh, you know, protected uh, patient and uh, and uh, clinician and investigator interface so that some assessment can be done through the video and there are already technologies available in this um, in this sense for instance uh, to assess the what is called the SARA scale the scale for the assessment of, of ataxia so looking at gait uh, looking at, at speech um, so to limit the burden for the children and for the parents, of course, of course, as much as possible. So the, as I was saying, we really want to cover different regions to be multi-regional in uh, North America, in, uh, in Brazil, uh, but also in Europe, in the main, uh, in the main countries. Um, we target 35 sites um, to, achieve a sample size of at least 75 subjects. So as you see, we are assuming uh, uh, two to three uh, uh, subjects per, per site. Um, the, the age is going to be between, uh, the age at study start should, should be between two to 20 years. Um, the neurological disease onset is after the first uh, 12 months. So we are going into the uh, late infantile and juvenile onset population. Um, you know, when we did this slide, uh, 
uh, you know, we were considering the digital endpoints uh, for, uh, you know, uh, for, and actually not only considering, we have uh, the last couple of days, we have uh, finalized the identification of, uh, of, uh, of a wearable sensor, uh, very, very light that can be applied to the, to the trunk and is going to be able to measure gait, uh, balance and other aspects of, uh, of ambulation. So we also, you know, really want to bring innovation by bringing new technologies in this uh, in this field, and this sensor will interact with the with the smartphone. As I said, we want to start enrollment this summer. We have started outreaching the the sites, uh, the first sites, but we want to uh, to intensify the site outreach in the next uh, in the next week. And and of course, we are also growing our team to make sure that this may happen. Uh, and I would say uh, an important aspect uh, is uh, that we want to make this, uh, this project uh, a long-term project. Uh, and in, I mean, also in order to allow to build a, let's say a community, an international community of, uh, of patients, parents and sites which are available and are willing to engage uh, in a project uh, over a long-term perspective. And I believe this is really essential for the success of the, of the project. In reality, we have uh, already started and I would say we were given the opportunity to provide some you know, funding and, uh, and advice on two interesting projects which are ongoing at the moment. One is the QRG1 Foundation patients uh, I mean, patients can give a preference study. The other one is the registry from the UK Tysax uh, Association. But of course, this is the very beginning. The natural history study represents a very important uh, milestone, I would say, for uh, uh, collaborating uh, not only with the scientific academy, but, uh, but also with uh, the, the patient's community. Uh, of course, nothing can be done uh, without, uh, you know, without people, without the value of people. Uh, this is a, a picture describing our management team at the moment. Of course, the team is, uh, is growing um, and we hope to grow organically in the next, uh, in the, in the next future, in the very next future. Uh, I would say we come from uh, different angles, from different experience and diverse you know, uh, horizon, but we have been all working before uh, in uh, lysosomal storage disorders. And, uh, and really we hope that this may give also more credibility with the, uh, you know, with all the community in this, in these terms. So we have a history of success in other uh, lysosomal storage disorders, and we hope that uh, you will <laughs> trust us uh, in, the, in the next future. So to summarize, uh, Azafaris is a uh, strongly science-driven company. We are uh, focusing on finding and, uh, and, and developing a new and innovative uh, disease-modifying treatment. I would say not only innovative, but also the way we want to develop it is to try to do it in an in innovative way, not just because we want to do uh, nice things, but because we strongly believe that nowadays uh, we can leverage on technologies that also allow uh, the, the industry to make studies in a, in a, in a different way, in a, uh, in a way that could meet uh, several aspects of, of, of needs of, of parents and patients. Um, as if we want to do is a, consider a first in class, a dual glucose cyanide modulator very highly potent versus two key enzymes involved in the metabolism of, uh, of glucosphingolipid and as such, uh, you know, uh, I mean, GM1 and GM2 can go side. And so with the potential to modify the course of GM1 and GM2, we are now already, uh, and again, I'm very happy to, to communicate this at clinical stage, we are starting and embarking into the, the natural history of disease study we want to do. We want to start with a project which has a strong uh, scientific, uh, uh, we'll say, fundament, and uh, and to keep on going if possible over the next uh, four to five years at the very least. Uh, of course, we are interested to develop and to have also to, to 
enhance our pipeline. So we have the, the, this discovery uh, program in other still genetic metabolic disease. Uh, we are building a team. I know it's uh, the Azafaros has been founded by uh, a person, Olivier Moran, who is probably, actually I hear him talking at the, at the GM1 cirrhosis session in parallel, who has a long lasting experience, uh, professional experience and also human experience in this area. And the last but not least, uh, at the moment, we have also important investors uh, uh, which, who are backing us. So that's also very, very important. Ruben, th thank you very much for, um, for that great overview. And uh, I, I think we've got time for, there's really one fundamental question, Ruben, that I wanna make sure you answer as sort of the punchline here, right? And that is you're, you're coming to the, the, these families with a, a treatment that is going to have what effect? Can you net that out for them? What is your expectations now that you're in clinical trials based on what you learned in preclinical or in other work as to why, what this will do that other treatments haven't done beforehand? Yeah, well, as I was uh, thank you, Kevin, this is a very, a very important point. Um, I would say that, uh, that the mechanism of action, the fact that is tackling two different, I mean, two different uh, angles of, uh, of the pathogenesis of the, of the disease is, uh, is very promising. The fact that it's very, is very potent and both enzymes are inhibited at very, very low, uh, a very, very low concentration. So this will very likely uh, avoid to have uh, off-target uh, safety, safety issue. I think that is not only in the characteristics of the compound, I think is in the way we want to develop this, uh, this compound. I mean, we really want to have, uh, uh, to show an effect on, uh, on clinically and disease pertinent endpoints. So certainly we will not want to develop it uh, or to possibly um, have it approved based on surrogate endpoints. So we strongly believe in the value of, uh, of uh, endpoints which are clinically relevant, which are important for the, for the, for the, for the child, important for, for, the, for the parents. So it's, a, it's more in the approach we want to, we want to give to our, uh, to our development. And in this sense, the fact that at this stage of development, we have already engaged in a, in a, we say in a quite uh, uh, important, also in terms of resources, uh, uh, natural history study gives uh, you know, us the hope that we can do things in a different way. Of course, everybody of us has his own idea and uh, there is a strong uh, commitment and passion from, from, from our side. I have been working in this area for quite a while and, uh, and I know how much important could be you know, sometimes we have, a, we have a, an idea of research a little bit too aseptic, a little bit too abstract, you know, to have uh, patients, you know, the patient centricity is, is a term which is a little bit abused in these days, but, uh, uh, you know, they, I would not be happy uh, to bring to the, to the uh, if we are going to bring to the market a product uh, and approved maybe which doesn't provide added value, really tangible added value for, for, um, for patients' life and for parents' life.